What's your name, boy? Hugo. Hugo Cabre. What does he do? He's a wind-up figure. This is the most complicated one I've ever seen. The story's not over yet. You've got a bit of talent. People said, well, well, it's a fantasy film. I said, no, it's not a fantasy film. The fantasy is the child's imagination, who's, which is also George's imagination, George Melies. The fantasy is what we're doing now, right here in this room, with these lights and cameras and mirrors. Something else is existing there. I don't know what, but there's something happening. It's not part of our normal day, the literal nature of how we live, but we're trying to create something different in a way from... Uh, but that fantasy, yeah, that fantasy is there. But it's not a fantasy film. <laughs> we all felt this must have been the way. Uh, it's as like, if you go back uh, being a child and you start to play imaginary stories, making up imaginary uh, characters. And um, yeah, there was this excitement of doing something new and special. Um, and uh, something audiences hadn't seen before. Uh, it wasn't necessarily, I don't say this in, in a negative way, but it wasn't necessarily professional in the way that, okay, we're making a film, it's going to be 15 days shooting or 20 days shooting. No, this is something very special, and this was a, a, a mission, an obsession. Magicians use machines like this when I was a boy. Some walked, some danced, some sang, but the secret was always in the clockwork. So I was really drawn to it first um, because of the boy and his isolation, um, keeping him away from the outside, from the world, actually, in a sense, when he had to look from the, um, uh, the outside looking into a world. Um, immediately, I, I associated, I guess I associated because I just do, because it is, it is part of very, very important part of my life. And that was when I was three years old in 1945. It was uh, contracted asthma, and I was kept away from most anything uh, mo children would do. So uh, my parents um, uh, would take me to the uh, movie theater to see films because it didn't involve sports or it didn't put me in a, a place that had any kind of um, greenery or any kind of nature to it. Um, and which I was allergic to, animals, that sort of thing. So they took me there. And so there was kind of, I guess, an empathy with the boy reading the book and the fact that it's resolved through this machinery, this, this invention of cinema, which uh, creates uh, um, not something tangible, by the way. You can't, can't hold cinema, or you can hold a statue or a painting, but it... it, it it's not tangible. It's something that happens in uh, the mind and the heart of the, uh, the spectator. If you've ever wondered where your dreams come from, this is where they're made. Add to that the fact that I was lucky enough to have a daughter at a late age, in my late 50s. And she just turned 12. And what that did was link me, interestingly enough, to uh, the limitless... I'm not saying I have it, but it linked me back to the limitless imagination of a child, where they can expect anything, and believe anything, create anything, because there are no there are no restrictions. Good day, Monsieur. Where are your parents? I work with my papa George at the toy booth. Surely you've seen me there before. And this is my cousin from the country, Hugo. Oh. Being kind of sheltered. Uh, especially in my childhood, uh, I was fascinated by these stereoscopic images I saw. And um, when I saw them with a stereo device, uh, there's, a, that's a, there's a world that's created, an ambiance that's created in the image, uh, particularly in the Viewmasters. There was a, like looking into a, a box in a way, and a window, really, a window. And inside the window, it went on limitless infinity perspective and uh, it had a quality to the image that somehow sparked something in my in my imagination that created another space that that's not 
real. That wasn't real around me at that moment. That hadn't been real. That wasn't practical. It wasn't literal. And so, um, for me, uh, 3D became a fascination. And then, of course, the 3D films were made in 1953. I saw all of them. Um, most of them not very good, but I did was fascinated by the stereoscopic image, and I've always has I always have been. The 3D for me was really exciting. I never thought I'd get to make a 3D film, um, but all these elements just came together. The timing was right. Uh, but I must tell you that 3D, uh, even though I designed it, the whole picture in 3D, I did as many uh, designs as possible uh, with Dante Ferretti and with Bob Richards. And, uh, no matter what happened, whenever we put that rig in position, that camera, everything changed. And... Uh, Therefore, it was not only just an exciting experience making the film, uh, and having the aspect of the, uh, having the, the having the the uh, um, the sense of almost feeling like children again, but also it was pretty um, risky and terrifying. Uh, but we were there. We had started walking on the tightrope, and you're not going to go back. Got to go ahead. <laughs> and so we were uh, every shot was something that was new to us, really. And new elements just popped up that we never expected. We did tests, it doesn't matter how many tests you do. It doesn't matter. But what was happening in those frames when we were working with this particular system uh, was, yes, I could feel that world coming together. I could feel it. Uh, I didn't know exactly, ultimately, how, how, it would, how it would look together completely. That is the heightened versions of Paris, for example, meaning um, it's Paris, but it looks like Paris is a slightly animated. Well, it feels like it's painted, but it isn't painted. It looks real. I'd imagine the whole world was one big machine. Machines never come with any extra parts, you know. They always come with the exact amount they need. So I figured if the entire world was one big machine, I couldn't be an extra part. I had to be here for some reason. And that means you have to be here for some reason too. Once we decided to do 3D, we realized there was a, a very strong re uh, responsibility and uh, an obligation to do something special. But we didn't try to have the 3D overwhelm the movie, the story, you see. And the story itself takes place with, okay, things that, are, that occurred in the past. But as far as if a film, if I feel like I can make a movie in black and white and we can't use 16 millimeter anymore, uh, uh, but we can get a feeling of that. And uh, yeah, there's these new cameras. Let's see what this new technology could do. I mean, it's opened up everything now. It's, it's um, uh, cinema is still with us and will be with us, but it's uh, gonna be made differently um, for the new generations uh, to take advantage of. Fix it. I know you've been seeding parts in the shop. I have well use those you haven't stolen yet. I never did imagine that I'd find a, a project that had all these elements that interested me, that, um, uh, that more than interest me as part of my life, which is uh, filmmaking and um, a sense of uh, heritage of filmmaking, uh, the preservation of it, the restoration of it, um, and the worry about the preservation and restoration of what we're doing now uh, uh, in terms of film or um, digital for the future. No, I, I had no idea that I would ever find one that would combine all of this together. And um, it turns out to be that uh, Hugo, the invention of Hugo Cabret, it was a perfect vehicle. 